suggest their experiment and redo it, or they can produce some type of theory, or or gain some type of knowledge from this this process. So, so starting with that, okay. So starting with observations. So Pyramid Lake. This project kind of started, uh, I guess, certainly before I showed up here, but because the uh, Reno or the Nevada Department of Wildlife had a question that they wanted to ask, along with uh, the Pyramid Lake Fisheries, which is a uh, tribal organization um, at Pyramid Lake. And uh, so, so I guess why don't I start with uh, Pyramid Lake itself. So Pyramid Lake has these Wahatan cutthroat trout that are endemic. They're only in um, Pyramid Lake. Uh, I'm sorry, they're not only in, but uh, the main strain is, is, is in uh, Pyramid Lake. And they used to, and they still do grow to very large sizes, but they were extirpated, or basically extinct from this individual lake in the late 1930s. And then after that, uh, a few different organizations decided to start stocking the lake with fish, with Lahontan cutthroat trout again. And there's questions about which ones, which fish were, had the most pure strain, the most, um, the most similar to the original strain of Lahontan cutthroat trout before they were extirpated from the lake. So then the, uh, I don't know, I guess I don't know if there was a Nevada Department of Wildlife came to Fager's lab and asked this question, if, if someone could look at the different strains of Lahontan cutthroat trout in the lake and try to help them understand uh, which fish are growing faster and more productive in the lake. So that was kind of the observational part of the study is we were trying to, we knew there was different strains of fish in the lake and we're trying to determine which ones grow better. So and a little more background here in the lake, I guess, is it's a, it's a it's like a geographic sink, so the water there is kind of salty because there's no outflow from there. So it's similar to Salt Lake in the fact that you know the water doesn't flow out of the lake and go to the ocean anywhere. So it's kind of a unique system and has some really unique fish because of that. All right, yeah. So m more along the lines of taking observ taking observations. When we start out on a project, one of the first things we do is, is just find all the literature we can, you know, on the, the system or the question we're asking, and just kind of read up as much as you can. So you do that, and you get as much background information as you can. And then, like I said before, you, you form a hypothesis. And in this case, it's due to different strains of Lahontan and cutthroat trout that grow at different rates. Okay. So then, after that, the first thing we do is we're going to we will head into the field and we'll collect as much data as we can, try to get as much information as we can. And I'll just go over some of the techniques we use in the field here. So on the upper left, to catch fish, what we use is called a, a gill net. And it's basically just a, a net you set on the bottom of the lake, in the benthic regions of the lake. And fish swim into it and get stuck in the net. And we can pull the fish out and get as much information as we can from the lake. Or not, not from, like, from the fish, uh, we get like length and weight information. Um, we get otoliths, which I'll show you in a few slides here and explain more what those are. Uh, and we also take their guts to get diet content. And then we take tissue samples as well for um, isotopes and genetic analysis. That way we can determine which strain is which. And you can so get some sense of a whole summer of taking diets here. That's what's in all those disgusting little yeah. jars. Just go to the winter digging. Too. And they smell great. So, and then the thing on the right there is a, it's called a trap net. And the, the part on the right, I don't know if you guys can see it, it says there's a lead there, there's an arrow. <coughs> Normally that, that lead extends way out in front of the trap net. And what that does is we set those near shore and when fish are kind of moving along shore and they run into that lead, they swim down and get stuck in the traps there. Yeah, and uh, yeah, well there's just a few different fish. The two on the outside are both Lahontan and cutthroat trout. You can see they get quite large. And then the one in the middle, or the two in the middle, I guess, are uh, Sacramento perch. Those are an invasive species uh, that usually uh, live in brackish or salty waters. So it was easy for them to invade into Pyramid Lake since it's already a salty lake. So other things we collect are, well, we try to understand the whole food web, you know, so we can understand the variation and growth and 
try to understand, you know, why fish might be growing at different rates. So starting really at the bottom of the food web, or close to it, I guess not the bottom, but um, we collect zooplankton, and we do that with the thing in the lower left there, it's called a, a zooplankton tow, and it's just a, a mesh that we drop to the bottom of the lake, and then there's an opening at the top, and as you pull it up, the different size meshes collect different size zooplankton, and we'll actually have more zooplankton here for you guys to look at and see what they look like under a microscope. But uh, yeah, these are really important because it's kind of where the food chain starts, and this is where a lot of larval fish, what they feed on, and uh, and you know, grow to larger sizes till they can eat either invertebrates or, or other fish. And in this lake, it's pretty interesting because a lot of the really large fish um, still eat a lot of cell plankton at times as well. So the one on the left is a coke pot, and the one on the right is a daphnia. I'll show you those in a minute here. People refer to Daphne as water thieves if you have that right. Alright, so moving slightly up the food chain, we go to benthic invertebrates, and benthic refers to uh, the, pretty much the bottom habitat of the lake. And in most lakes, that's where most of the production occurs, but uh, pyramid's a little bit different in that uh, there's a lot of uh, production out in the open water. But to collect benthic invertebrates, we use this thing on the upper left here. It's called an Ekman trap or an Ekman dredge. And what you do is you, I don't know if you can see, there's two little doors on the side there. And we drop that to the bottom of the lake. And you, you can send down a weight on a line that hits a little trigger on the top there. And then the bottom snaps shut. And you can pull up the sediments. And then you kind of work through the sediments to find all the, the invertebrates in there. And then invertebrates are, you know, it's really important to collect invertebrates because you'll find them in fish diets. And you want to be able to relate that to how fast fish are growing. Um, and, the, and we have some, some samples of those for you to look at as well. We'll kind of explain those a little more when we do that. Yeah, we'll do different bugs there. All right, and then, so I mentioned before we take tissue samples for isotopes. And I guess the, the pictures on the right are kind of demonstrating it, you know, what we find in diets. And we like to, to be able to relate the diets and the isotopes a little bit. Um, the isotope graph can be a little confusing, but what it does here is it takes the uh, the amount of nitrogen of, uh, of a heavier mo uh, heavier molecule of nitrogen, and it can there's different ratios of, of different weight weighted nitrogen in different species and different animals, and it'll help you determine at what level in the food chain um, each animal is. So these two marks down here at the bottom, the square and the dot or in the triangle, those would be something like uh, like the uh, zooplankton we were looking at before. And then as you go up higher, the fish will be somewhere near the top. So that's what that graph tells us there. Um, and then you know, I just have a couple pictures here showing that we collect diets and those can be, you know, mixed with, you know, fish and vertebrates and zooplankton. We kind of have to sort through those and figure out proportions. So the diet will tell you a lot about, you, know, you can imagine if you go out and you capture this fish, the diet will tell you a lot about what that fish has just been eating in the last 24 hours. The isotopes is actually done from a tissue sample of the fish, you know, off their back or something, and it tells you about what they've been eating over about four months. And so it really tells you much more integrated about their diet, whereas the snapshot of the diet tells you really important information about what they actually ate on a short-term basis. So it's a nice compliment. And the idea is you are what you eat. So you'll show up higher here if you eat more meat, and less high if you eat less meat, lower if you eat less meat. And then the, uh, the x-axis on the graph, I didn't explain that. That uh, kind of shows where in the, in the system a, uh, a fish might be getting its food from. So it's, it might be getting its food way out in the middle of the lake, or it might be doing it near shore. And that, that x-axis will kind of tell us that information. All right, now I mentioned before we take otoliths, and otoliths are, uh, they're basically ear bones or something similar. They're these calcified structures